Deputy Prime Minister Teo Chi Hien, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the welcome dinner of the Singapore Global Dialogue 2011. This event kickstarts the second annual Singapore Dialogue, which is organized by the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Since its establishment as the Institute for Defense and Strategic Studies in 1996, the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, or RSIS, has become a leading research and graduate teaching institution in strategic and international affairs in the Asia-Pacific region. RSIS would like to extend its sincere gratitude to all sponsors for the Singapore Global Dialogue 2011, namely our platinum sponsor, Tamasic International, as well as our gold sponsors, Wilma International Private Limited, which is also sponsoring tonight's sumptuous dinner, Shangri-La Hotel Singapore, Hotel Properties Limited, and the Singapore Tourism Board. We would also like to thank the International Herald Tribune, which is the official international newspaper for the Singapore Global Dialogue. Without further ado, may we now invite Ambassador Barry Deska, Dean of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, to deliver his welcome remarks. Ambassador Deska, please. Deputy Prime Minister Teo Chi Hien, Mr. Eddie Teo, Chairman of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Board of Governors, Mr. S. Danabalan, Chairman Tomasic Holdings, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of RSIS and our principal partner, Tomasic International Private Limited, I am honored to welcome you to the second Singapore Global Dialogue. The Singapore Global Dialogue is a unique event established as a response to the dynamic and rapidly evolving world order we are facing today. As international institutions struggle to address a range of traditional and non-traditional security concerns and prolonged economic uncertainties, new initiatives and solutions are required to tackle these ongoing challenges. As the global power balance shifts towards the Asia Pacific, Asian voices must respond and take a stronger leadership role in influ influencing collective responses to global strategic issues. In this context, the Singapore Global Dialogue seeks to provide a distinctive platform for responding to contemporary global challenges. By, gather, by gathering a, a distinguished lineup of speakers from the Asia Pacific region and across the globe, we expect this Singapore Global Dialogue series to play an important role in the search for innovative ways of managing the world's evolving strategic concerns. Tomorrow's panels will focus on the shifting global balance of power, new directions in global governance, and the impact of new trends and emerging technologies. Our speaker tonight has paid close attention to these issues. Mr. Teo Chi Hien was appointed Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore on the 1st of April 2009. As of May this year, he also serves as Coordinating Minister for National Security, Minister for Home Affairs, and Minister in Charge of the Civil Service. Following a distinguished career in the Singapore Armed Services, uh, Singapore Armed Forces, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Teo was elected Member of Parliament in 1992 and has served as Minister for Defence, Minister for Education and Minister for the Environment. This evening, the Deputy Prime Minister will share his insights on a major global strategic issue, the changing nature of cyberspace as it becomes more open and social, 
and ever increasing numbers of people are getting plugged in to the internet. These developments bring both benefits and challenges globally to society, governments and business and it would require calibrated responses from decision makers. It is my pleasure now, without further ado, to invite Deputy Prime Minister Teo Chi Hien to officially open the second Singapore Global Dialogue and to deliver tonight's keynote address. Deputy Prime Minister, please. Thank you very much, Barry. Mr. Eddie Teo, Chairman of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Board of Governors, Ambassador Barry Desker, Dean of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Mr. Dana Balan, Chairman of the Masek Holdings, distinguished guests, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to join you this evening at the second Singapore Global Dialogue. It, it has been about four months since I moved from the Ministry of Defence to the Ministry of Home Affairs, as recounted by Barry, and it has been an interesting transition for me. The Ministry of Home Affairs threat landscape is extremely varied and unpredictable. Some new challenges are driven by significant shifts in the global geopolitical landscape. This is the case in areas such as terrorism, where events in the Middle East and the region have a tremendous impact on our internal security situation. And this is because we are a small island nation, many visitors, very open port, transportation hub, financial hub. And so the waves of influence from around the world sweep upon our shores very quickly and very readily. However, some challenges are driven by changes in the way societies operate and the way people live their daily lives. And this evening, I would like to focus on the rise of the internet and its related technologies. It's difficult to imagine today public, commercial and social activities being conducted without some form of electronic technology. Email and social media are now the prevalent forms of telecommunication and have become a staple part of our lives. According to the Comscore Media Metrics, 82% of the 2.9 million internet users in Singapore frequent social networking sites, with Singapore ranked among the top 10 markets for Twitter globally. I know some of you are very familiar with Twitter. In a survey conducted by London Science Museum, 3,000 people were asked what they could not live without. Interestingly, more people said they would rather do without clean drinking water than an internet connection. And even Facebook and email rank higher in priority than a flushing toilet or shower. So the next time you may meet a thirsty, unshaven and unsanitary internet user checking his email. But I suspect that this is an example of what people have come to take for granted and cannot imagine that they will ever have to lose as much as what they now consider indispensable in their lives. While the advancement of Infocom technologies has provided us with tremendous convenience and opportunities, it has also created a unique set of challenges. The central dilemma is how to balance the benefits which the internet has created in terms of openness, accessibility and convenience against the risks of abuse, exploitation and criminality. And this balance plays out on three different levels, society, government, and business. The first is the society we live in. Cyberspace has created a new universe of social interactions. Social networking sites have enabled us to connect with all friends and reach out to people across continents from diverse cultures. Some of these old friends you want to keep in touch with, perhaps some of them you're not so keen to keep in touch with. But if you have a Facebook site, they all turn up. It has also allowed small communities spread out over distant geographies to come together 
and keep their traditions, culture, and languages alive. I met a couple, uh, I attended their wedding, one from Singapore and the other from Chicago, who were able to widen their social networks beyond their own small local communities. They belong to a small community here in Singapore and also a small community in Chicago. And they got married after getting to know each other over the internet. They, I think, now live in Chicago. I hope they'll come back to Singapore one day. While the internet has been a positive force in creating new social networks and widening social circles, it has also given rise to concerns on how personal data shared online could be exploited for harmful means. For example, the internet can be used to stalk a person, for criminals or sexual predators to prey on children, for cyberbullying, and for malicious attacks against an individual, all of which can be very difficult for a person to protect himself from. Besides facilitating social connections, the cyberspace has also shaped social change and activism. The internet provides more avenues for expression and organization, and we should welcome this. The cyber world is much more than just an efficient postal system. It enables an individual to broadcast his experiences and views instantaneously to the entire world and generate a large community of interest within a short space of time. However, the organizing power of social media, which can bring about instantaneous and uncoordinated mass mobilization of people, can also be misused, even relatively simple technologies. The anonymity of the internet means that extreme views can be aired without accountability. And we often see people making statements in cyberspace that they would never make in the real world. This, at times, generates a culture of irresponsibility. I was in Indonesia last week and was told that recent communal dis disturbances in the island of Ambon were triggered by the rapid spread of a false and malicious rumour via SMS. A member of one community was involved in a road accident and was brought to hospital by members of another community. Unfortunately, he subsequently succumbed to his injuries. But the word spread that his death was caused by members of that other community who had brought him to the hospital, sparking the disturbances. It is also widely known that the cyber world has been used for more sinister ends. Terrorists have used the internet as a means to disseminate tradecraft and ideology. So we're able to bring together on the internet self-radicalized persons where ideology, methods are disseminated. And these are then married up with everyday means to create the ability to conduct a lone wolf attack. Inspire magazine, an online publication of the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, is one such example. So are the online lectures of radical ideologues such as Anwar al-Awlaki and Fayez Muhammad. We need, therefore, to develop a set of norms to guide behavior on cyberspace so that individuals can be protected when they use social media, and social media does not become a tool to spread violence or incite public order incidents, whether they are in Ambon or in London. The second is the government sector. Most governments rely on the internet to carry out public functions and to connect with citizens. In Singapore, almost all government transactions can be done electronically. However, the fact that we are a highly networked government has itself created a very significant vulnerability. Many of us here would be familiar with the cyber attacks on Estonia in 2007 and Georgia in 2008. The attacks crippled online transactions and communication systems affecting the government, businesses and individuals. We've had cyber attacks in Singapore, such as the one carried out on Singapore's National Parks Board. Well, that may not have been as detrimental an impact, but they do have the potential to result in great reputational damage. And even when an attack doesn't occur, sometimes the ATMs in 
some of our banks go down, and that causes tremendous disruption. And that's just um, an accident or an incident that's occurred without anyone trying to cause it to happen. Most critical information infrastructure sectors, such as energy, infocom, and finance, are also highly dependent on the cyber sphere for effective functioning. The interdependency of our network systems means that a successful attack in one sector would have many knock-on effects which could effectively paralyze the nation. The third sector is that of private businesses. From a commercial perspective, the internet has helped businesses to serve their customers faster, cheaper, and better. Businesses can now launch products across geographical boundaries and expand their customer base instantaneously. However, the proliferation of e-commerce and network communication has at the same time opened businesses to vulnerabilities on many fronts. Cyber crime is a growing phenomenon that demands critical attention from businesses. A 2009 study by computer antivirus maker McAfee estimated that cyber crime costs businesses over 1 trillion US dollars across the globe. In Singapore alone, IT security firm Symantec estimated cyber crime to have led to a loss of 870 million US dollars last year, affecting more than 1.2 million people here or close to one quarter of our population. Cyber criminals are increasingly moving beyond the realm of hacking to stealing individuals' credit card details, to launching large-scale intellectual property thefts that have left the potential to cause severe damage. Many indicators point to future cybercrime attacks becoming more complex, severe, and difficult for businesses to detect and prevent. While the insider, that is the employee within the company, is often said to be the weakest link in cybersecurity, there is increasingly a blurring in distinction between insider and outsider threats. Attackers are becoming increasingly sophisticated in infiltrating a network and stealing information just as an insider would. Indeed, the recent spike in cybersecurity attacks in both frequency and severity against a host of well-known international business enterprises has exposed the gravity of the threat. Without a robust response, businesses are likely to continue to face such attacks and the implications for businesses could be far-reaching beyond financial or economic losses to reputational damage and erosion of consumer confidence. At a broader level, again, the anonymity accorded by the cybersphere can serve as an impetus for the formation of a nexus between cyber criminals, terrorists, and others bent on industrial espionage. The procurement of malicious cyber capabilities is a logical extension of these actors in their attempts to disrupt not just the economic viabilities of businesses, but even national security and stability. The fast-changing nature of the cybersecurity threat means that no country or organization can plan and implement responses in silos because attacks come from almost any direction outside your, your own system, outside your own national borders, outside your jurisdiction. Effective cybersecurity efforts require perspectives and expertise that transcend national and organizational boundaries. We will need to strengthen our collaborative capacity among government agencies, industry, academia, and other stakeholders to deal with cybersecurity threats. Globally, there is a realization that more needs to be done. I listened carefully this year in, uh, at this year's Munich Security Conference to the speech made by Mr. William Hague, the UK Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, in which he appealed for governments to come together to agree on a set of rules governing the use of cyberspace. He also spelt out the principles that could form the basis of such collaboration. Singapore strongly believes in cross-border cooperation. Besides being a member of the Meridian process, we are also working with Interpol to establish the Interpol Global Complex in Singapore. And in line with efforts to enhance our capability to tackle new and emerging crime threats, Interpol will also set up 
part of its cyber security operations within this new complex when it is completed in 2013. In dealing with cyber security threats, businesses often face tensions involving cost, efficiency and resilience in the design of their IT systems and networks. Resources are, after all, always limited, and a risk-based approach is necessary. We need to calibrate our responses according to our risk appetite and the potential damage that can occur. The government has taken the lead in launching several cyber security initiatives and collaborations with businesses here in Singapore. The Infocom Development Authority has developed Singapore's Infocom Security Master Plan, which fosters close partnerships with the private sector through multiple platforms. For example, information sharing protocols have been established between IDA and internet service providers to understand the seriousness of emerging cybersecurity vulnerabilities and to take the necessary steps to mitigate against these threats. The Singapore Infocom Technology Security Authority, or in short, SITSA, is also working with various industry regulators to reach out to owners and operators of critical information infrastructure, such as those in the energy, financial and infocom sectors. The objective is to assess cybersecurity vulnerabilities in order to build in safeguards in a holistic manner and in a consistent manner across the systems. Trusted platforms will also be developed to encourage critical Infocom infrastructure owners and operators to share information on vulnerabilities and lessons learned without fear that such disclosure may erode their economic competitiveness or consumer confidence. Such platforms have worked well in other countries. They are a good gateway for businesses to acquire a high-level view of the threat environment and to share their individual experiences. They will also pave the way for stakeholders to initiate their own security community of best practices over time and to collaborate on projects across the industry. Besides information exchange, a key component of our cybersecurity strategy is to train and exercise personnel on established procedures and policies as part of efforts to strengthen our cyber infrastructure frameworks. Just last week, SITSA worked with the Monetary Authority of Singapore an association of banks in Singapore to successfully conduct one such exercise for the financial industry here. But of course, in the same week, not because of the exercise, one of the ATM systems of the banks went down. The exercise incorporated cyber attack elements into a terrorist attack scenario and tested the business continuity plans of various financial institutions in the event of such attacks. In the coming months, we will boost our national capability to counter cyber security threats through the setting up of a national cyber security center. The center, which will be headed by SITSA, will help the government deal more effectively with cyber security threats and vulnerabilities to our national systems and our national infrastructure by enhancing capabilities in early detection and prevention. It will also serve as a nodal point to coordinate awareness and implementation of measures between public and private sector stakeholders and will be the key contact point for working with our counterparts and friends around the world in the event of mass attacks which affect more than one country. A safe and functioning cyberspace is critical to our society, economy and national security. The frequency and sophistication of cyber attacks will continue to grow and so must our capabilities and response plans. And when I say our capabilities and response plans, I don't just mean our national capabilities and response plans, but our collective capabilities and response plans across countries. As in all matters of security, there is no practical means of achieving a 100% secure solution. Hence, the issue is one of managing risks. Just as the government has rallied the community to address the terrorist threat, the same has to be done in the case of cybersecurity, creating awareness, disseminating information, motivating action, laying out plans. The government's role is to put in place a collaborative framework that enables stakeholders to pool their collective wisdom and to address the cyber threat in a coordinated and concerted manner. 
The internet is a global resource and where the right balance lies and where the right balance lies between openness and regulation is something that we need to work on with all community stakeholders. I hope that the Singapore Global Dialogue, when it addresses this as one of the three topics that you'll be talking about, will offer the opportunity to take the discussion on this topic to a deeper level. It's a topic that affects all of us and it's a topic that affects something which is obviously dear to the people who visited the Science, Cent the Science Museum in London, much more so than drinking water or having a shower or flushing toilets. So on this note, I wish you a fruitful and engaging dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister.